Kathy Zip, Solar Power World's Inverter Reporter. And today we're going to be looking at Fronius's Residential Solar Inverter, the Primo. And I'm lucky to have our executive editor, Lee Teschler, here because while I will be talking about some of the model's features, he will be taking a look inside to see what makes the inverter tick. And based on what we see, we'll take some educated guesses about how Fronius designed its inverter and implemented some of its more important features. Great. Well, as I said, the Primo is a compact single phase inverter for residential applications. It comes in power classes from 3.8 to 15 kilowatts. It's part of the same snap inverter line as Fronius's commercial solution, the Simo. So it has this neat hinge mounting design to make installation really easy. In fact, it's said to install in less than 15 minutes. The inverter assembly is actually in two main pieces. One piece is screwed, bolted, or otherwise attached to the wall. And it also contains the electrical connections made to the utility wiring and to the solar array. Once this back piece is attached to the wall and the wiring has been put in place, the second piece is brought up and into two hinges. It then just swings into place. There are electrical connections made between the two pieces as the unit swings into its wall mount. Then two Torx screws are tightened down to keep the two pieces mated together. I should also say that we've removed the cover from the inverter we have here so we can get a good look at its internals. But that's not necessary if we were just installing it. The only thing that needs to be off is a small cover at the bottom that exposes the torque screws. Excellent. And another neat aspect of the Primo is that it has a transformerless design, which makes it lightweight and increases efficiency. Very much so. You can use a transformerless inverter when the solar array is not connected to ground. Contrast this idea with what happens if the solar array is grounded. If it's grounded, that means there's a connection to ground on both the DC input of the inverter, in other words, on the solar array, and on the AC output of the inverter because the AC utility you're connecting it to is grounded. In that case, you need what's called a galvanic isolation transformer to separate the AC utility ground from the solar array ground. The problem with this galvanic isolation transformer is that it sits in the output of the inverter, which means it has to handle the inverter's full power output. In this case, that would be at least 10 kilowatts. A transformer big enough to handle that level of power would be pretty heavy. In fact, so heavy that if it were in this thing, I almost certainly wouldn't be able to pick it up. <laughs> Another important feature is that the inverter has dual PowerPoint trackers, offering both dual and single MPPT options, which allows more design flexibility because the inverter can connect to one array or two, which avoids the need for a second inverter. As a quick review, MPPT is maximum PowerPoint tracking. It's a technique used to maximize the power output of solar arrays. The necessity for MPPT arises because for any given set of operational conditions, solar modules have a single operating point where the values of the current voltage result in a maximum power output. That's a dynamic quantity which changes depending on the amount of irradiation as well as other factors such as temperature and the age of the cells. Maximum power point trackers utilize electronics to identify this point and extract the maximum power available from the array. We examined the main circuit board on the Primo to see if we could spot where the MPPT and in inverter circuitry is realized. The way solar inverters often handle MPPT is with a single phase boost stage used to boost the voltage from the panel and track the MPPT. The input current and panel voltage are both sensed and these two values are then used by the MPPT algorithm which calculates the reference point at which the panel input needs to be maintained for maximum power transfer. If you look at the main board, you'll see a chip called the STM32F405, which implements a type of a processor called an ARM Cortex-M4 with a floating point unit and running at 168 MHz. That's certainly fast enough to constantly monitor two MPPs and to do a lot of other stuff besides. The board also contains a Texas Instruments chip called the 2845B, which is a pulse width modulator control chip used for implementing DC to DC conversion. So our guess is the Texas Instruments chip is there for the boost conversion you need for MPPT. The inverter circuit itself lies on the upper circuit board and the power transistors that make up the inverter mount to the opposite side of the board along with some heavy duty heat sinking so you can't really see them from this view. 
And I know a couple other features that you might want to point out have to do with arc fall interruption and revenue grade metering. So can you explain that, Lee? Right. Metering on modern inverters is taken care of electronically. You don't find electromechanical meters doing this stuff. And by revenue grade, we mean having an accuracy of better than 2%. Revenue grade metering is an option on this inverter, and it was pretty easy to guess where that was being taken care of in the primal because there is a small circuit board here that plugs into the main inverter board. So our guess is the plug-in board does the revenue grade metering because it's something that plugs in when the inverter is being assembled, as an optional feature would be. On this plug-in board, there are only a few main chips. The main IC is an STM32F100ZE, which is a high-performance ARM Cortex-M3 32-bit RISC core operating at 24 megahertz, which also contains high-speed embedded memories and a 12-bit analog-to-digital converter, something that would come in handy for measuring power levels accurately. Also on this plug-in board is a macrocell array chip, which is basically a prefabricated array of higher-level logic functions, along with some analog comparators and a solid-state switch chip. These would all come in handy for metering because the key parameters calculated during energy measurements are root mean square current and voltage, active and reactive power and energy, power factor, and maybe frequency. Finally, we'll mention arc fault interruption. If there's any breakdown in wiring or the electrical connections on the solar array, you'll get electrical arcing between the wires that can electrify the installation, maybe making the mounting system hot and potentially shocking anyone touching the unit. Worse, arcs like that can also cause fires. That's why there's now a UL requirement for detecting arcs and for a test circuit to verify correct operation of the arc detection unit. This circuit has to be able to simulate an arc event and verify that a failure triggers an interruption, much in the same way a person can self-test a GFI outlet in your home. Problem is, it's tough to actually detect an arc. To do that, the inverter typically converts the DC voltage into a digital signal and then processes it to determine the spectral noise and the nominal power. Problem is that string inverters generate noise that looks much like an arc event. The algorithms to detect these differences can get complicated because they have to avoid false detects. In addition, these al algorithms have to work quickly enough to break the circuit before the arc can cause any damage. A typical arc detection circuit usually includes an analog front end, an analog digital converter, and a processor. The analog front end is a current transformer that measures the current in the string of panels. It acts as a bandpass filter across the range of frequencies to be observed. The UL standards allows just two seconds to open a switch and shut the system down after an arc event. You need most of the two seconds to open the switch, which is mechanical in nature. Once the voltage is converted to a digital signal, it typically needs to be processed in the frequency domain to filter out the spectral noise on the DC bus and then go through multiple fast Fourier transform filters to decide whether an arc event is occurring. When an arc event is detected, the unit needs to shut the inverter down. Analog outputs driven by a PWM could be used to open the front end relays to disconnect the string of panels and trigger an enunciator. If you take a look at the main circuit board containing the inverter circuit, you notice multiple relays. So it's probably a safe bet that at least two of them are involved in disconnecting the DC lines from the array for arc fault interruption, and two more are there to apply the arc fault simulation to the detector circuit for testing. Awesome, and lastly, like the SIMO, the PRIMO does have Wi-Fi and a SunSpec Modbus interface for monitoring and data logging. And Fronius's communication options also allow you to use a third-party platform, or you can use theirs at FroniusSolar.web, and you can even monitor on your smartphone. To learn more about the PRIMO and other options from Fronius, you can also attend its webinar series or in-person training sessions listed on its website. And thanks for watching, and thanks so much for teaming up with me, Lee. Thanks.